Today, I'm going to be speaking with Elizabeth Kopik, who's an assistant professor of linguistics at Boston University, who specializes in semantics, the study of meaning in human language. It's really great having you on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. I think this is a really important topic and I'm very pleased to be uh, giving my opinions about it. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess just to kind of set some context, oftentimes when people have discussions that are very politically oriented, like uh, what does the Second Amendment really mean or what are the, the, the actual laws around deportation in terms of what should or can be decided versus what must be decided or, you know, we can think about all of the, these different political implications. There's often a split between the idea of a textualist interpretation that is just what's written versus one that considers when such a statute or law might have been written or, or kind of all of these different factors that lend, lend themselves more to interpretation. One aspect of this is are we correctly understanding the textualist interpret interpretation in terms of the, the way that it is written and, and what that even actually means? Can you talk a little bit about the basis for asking that question and maybe some examples of where the answer may be? We're not understanding the language co correctly necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. So there's yeah plenty of discussion about whether we should be textualists or purposivists or any other kind of ist. But there's much less discussion about whether lawyers and judges are actually competent to carry out textualism. There's this misconception that just because you uh, subscribe to the word of the day, you speak English, and you did well in fifth grade grammar, you're qualified to make pronouncements about how the English language works. But there's a whole field of study called <laughs> linguistics whose findings are applicable to uh, these very, very consequential uh, decisions and thousands of innocent people can be summarily rounded up and put into federal prison where slavery is legal, by the way, uh, all because of linguistic ignorance. Uh, so one uh, example of that is in this case called Nielsen v. Priop. Priop uh, is for Moni Priop. He was born in a refugee camp. He is therefore stateless. He can't be deported anywhere, but he's not a citizen of the, of the United States. And he served a jail sentence for possession of marijuana, which ended uh, seven years before he was then rounded up by ICE and put into federal prison under this law that says that the government shall take into custody any alien, quote unquote alien, that's a non-citizen who... A, B, C, or D, where these are things that, uh, you know, some criminal offense they might have uh, committed. When the alien is released, what does released mean? That means they were released from the custody that they were in before. And um, so it says that the government shall take into custody any alien who A through D, when the alien is released, Moni Priyap, uh, was released seven years before he was later taken into custody. And so uh, the ACLU is defending him and saying uh, he wasn't taken into custody when he was released. He was taken into custody seven years later. Uh, so he should be released from federal prison now. Uh, <laughs> and and so fundamentally, this is about the words shall and when. Is that really what this comes down to? Well, there are a number of linguistic issues that arose. One is what does when mean? Does it mean at the same time or does it mean at the same time or as soon as possible thereafter? Mm. And the the um, the government, the Trump administration was arguing for an interpretation that inserts or as soon as possible thereafter. So it's putting a little meat on the bones of the literal meaning. It's expanding right. The literal meaning a little bit. So it's a little bit less textualist, their interpretation. Ironically, <laughs> the government's position was supported by the Supreme Court under the guise of textualism because Neil Gorsuch tricked the ACLU lawyer who was defending Moni Priyap into saying that her interpretation relied on the idea that this when clause. <clears throat> which is an adverbial clause, modifies the noun alien. And so he got her to say, yes, well, sometimes an adverb can modify a noun, which is not true. 
And uh, as a result, the, the Supreme Court decision was against Moni Priyap and against the thousands of immigrants like him. Uh, and so they will now have to all be rounded up because an adverb cannot modify a noun. There's sometimes the feeling that these types of um, questions and and we might call them disagreements or differences of opinion are basically just used in order to evade what many would consider as just or having to answer questions or whatever. You know, one recent thing was when William Barr, the former attorney general under Trump, was questioned by Kamala Harris, who asked him whether, whether anyone suggested to him that he carry out a certain investigation. The, the details don't really matter. And he actually paused and said, what I'm grappling with is the word suggest and really huge political questions about, you know, possible impropriety by the Justice Department, all these different things come down to what does he think the word suggests means versus what did Kamala Harris mean? The word suggests means at the time, et cetera. These things can th these are really not trivial issues when they're applied to such important things, are they? Right. Yeah. And I think it's there's this misconception that uh, the textualists are always going to be the ones who are the more conservative uh, judges or, or uh, decisions. And uh, we're all textualists now, as Justice Kagan says. And in this case that I was just discussing, the text was actually on the side of the people who are uh, on the side of human rights, on the side of people who are getting rounded up and sent to prison unfairly. Uh, and as liberals, we shouldn't be afraid of being textualists and of uh, showing that the text really is on our side. Uh, <clears throat> That's interesting. When it comes to um, when it comes to the Second Amendment, you know, there's been a lot of confusion about what the phrase well-regulated militia means. There are some who think about it as meaning regulation in the sense of government regulation, the way we think of you know OSHA and uh, the Department of Transportation and 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 these types of things. Uh, whereas whereas others say that that's really not what it meant at the time, and you have to understand the language of the time period to really to really get that. Can you talk a little bit about the change in the English language over time and the role that that plays in us when we try to figure out what is even the textualist interpretation? Because the language has changed over the last 200 years. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think that gets into uh, matters of uh, legal theory that are a little bit above my pay grade. Sure. Uh, I. I mean, I'm qualified to talk about uh, the principles of semantics and pragmatics that are applicable at any stage of a given language. And whether or not you decide you want to uh, take into consideration the context of the time and, and apply that to the, whatever you think the literal meaning of the words was at that time, uh, that's a matter for you as a legal theorist to decide. Uh, well, let me phrase like, it in a different yeah. way. Yeah. If one is making the claim that we should be going by what was literally meant by those who wrote something, we have to take into consideration how language was used at the time it was written. Do we not? Is that fair? I think that's a decision that has to be made. Wow. Uh, so it may so, some might say, no, we're going to just go by how we what that would mean today. It, it is a bit absurd now that you put it that way. Right. Uh, so we have to decide, is it the literal meaning of today or the literal meaning of then of the yes. time that it was written? And uh, I think reasonable uh, reasonable arguments could per potentially be made on both sides. Uh, but deciding what the literal meaning is, is not a trivial thing. It's not something you can just say because you are a native speaker of English. So there's this right. Scalia and Garner tome on legal interpretation that is this big, white, male, authoritative text. And they just state that in sentences of this form, only this type of interpretation 
is possible with no foundation. And then they appeal to, you know, very serious sounding things like De Morgan's theorem, which is actually a principle of propositional logic and not a not a principle of natural language. And in propositional logic, everything is disambiguated because you have little brackets. In English, you don't have that kind of disambiguation. And so some of the ambiguity remains. And so it, you have these these people who are very importantly placed people in very big, important positions making pronouncements with no actual foundation. And it, the consequences can be enormous. It was interesting recently watching this Kyle Rittenhouse trial in Wisconsin, where when it got into the jury instruction portion where the jury was not in the room and it was lawyers for each side kind of talking to the judge about what is going to be the text of the instructions that is given to the jurors. There were lots of interesting moments where the judge said my belief about what the 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 sort of fundamental nature of this instruction is differs from how it's written. And so I've modified it for the instructions I will be giving the jury based on, you know, I'm paraphrasing here what he believed more accurately represented the gist of what the jury is to decide. It's interesting that in those situations, it's a couple of lawyers, you know, arguing with a judge and it's no one is ever brought in who specializes in language to opine as to what what is really meant by that. I mean, is that do do we see that in any different courts where they say, let's actually talk to someone whose specialty is linguistics to figure out what the intent here is? Yeah, I would love it if the ACLU would hire a, uh, a linguist and I would love it if more people trained in linguistics went into law and I would love it if more lawyers and judges would talk to linguists about uh, the issues that they're discussing because they're, while they're while law is a specialty that you can't just waltz into just because you're a linguist. Yes. The same is true on the other side. And I wish there was more talking between law lawyers and, ling and linguists. Can you give us one or two other kind of interesting examples as to how uh, interpreting text had major consequences that you've studied and whether they're well known cases or not? I mean, just anything you think would be kind of interesting and illustrative for the for the audience. Uh, all right. There is uh, an example um, that uh, Jill Anderson has written about. Uh, it involves the American Disabilities Association, uh, the, the ADA. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, <clears throat> actually, maybe I should try, I should use the Carico example. Um, So there's a a big a, a big uh, drug company, Novo Nordisk, and a smaller generic drug company, Carico. Mm -hmm. And Carico wants to make this generic drug available to a wide variety of people, um, and the big drug company is preventing that. And there's a law that says that the generic company can make the uh, uh, the drug available if uh, the patent uh, does not cover any of the FDA approved uses. <laughs> uh, sorry, does not cover one of the FDA approved uses. And that is actually scopally ambiguous. So it is not the case that it covers any of them. So it covers none of them would be one interpretation or there is an approved use that it doesn't cover. That's another scope interpretation. So not is a scopally mobile operator. One is a scopally mobile operator. And these two scopally mobile, mobile operators interact to create a scope ambiguity, not something that is taught in fifth grade grammar. Right. right? Um, and there's an absurd interpretation where it covers none of the approved uses. And there's a reasonable interpretation uh, where um, there's one use it doesn't cover. Under that circumstance, the generic company should have the right to make the drug available for that use, right? Yes. Um, and uh, just by fiat, the 
people interpreting this law said, well, whenever you have a negation and something like one, it has to be interpreted like none. That's just what I decided. And therefore, we're going with the absurd interpretation. Um, <clears throat> so the recognition of scope ambiguity was nowhere in the discussions about this law. And as a consequence, people don't have access to affordable drugs. Right. So the, the, the sort of reasonable interpretation would have been this is this is written in a way where the generic manufacturer really should be able to manufacture this drug on the basis of there being one use. And the one that was applied ultimately was this absurd interpretation that led to the outcome of the generic manufacturer just can't do it. Exactly. Right. Wow. Yeah. That uh, the number of instances of things like that probably would be shocking if we were to look in detail at uh, at, at court cases. Um, we've been speaking with Elizabeth Kopik, who's an assistant professor of linguistics at Boston University, who specializes in semantics. I really appreciate your time today and you talking to us about these cases. Thank you very much for the opportunity.